Google Hangout. It's Australia Decides. Yes, we're ripping off what every uh, election coverage has done in the history of time, and we're using that word. But Australia has decided on their Ashes squad. I have two of the most important heavy-hitting cricket minds that we could find. I have Dan Bretty from our Sydney office. How are you, Dan? I'm very well. I'm relieved in, in a way. Excellent. Relieved is what we want. And we also have David Hopps from his study. David Hopps, how are you? Good morning. I, I wouldn't say I'm overexcited having looked at the squad, but it is early. <laughs> it is early. Uh, Bertig, let's go straight to you um, and let's let's ask the big questions. Is this the oldest um, Ashes squad that you can remember? It's certainly a lot older than the squad that went to India. Um, it's uh, it's better it's better balance. It's better balance than the squad that went to India. That's the that's the main thing that that comes through. Uh, and I it's, it's sort of an old, inexperienced squad, isn't it? I mean, because you've got Hatton hasn't played that many tests, really. I mean, there's a lot of talk about how experienced Hatton is, but he hasn't played many tests. You've got Ryan Harris who hasn't played many tests, and Chris Rogers who's played one, and yet they're all they've all come in, you know, on the on the rosy side of thirty. They've all probably got about 10 good tests left in them at most, and that's how many Australia's playing against England in the next 12 months. So uh, it's a it's a it's a reasonable it's a reasonable match, but uh, yes, the uh, the future is going to have to wait until next year. It's, it would take Ryan Harris about 15 years to play 10 good tests, but uh, we'll start with the squad. I'll read, I'll read it out just for those of you who haven't read the piece below yet. Uh, it's Michael Clark as captain, Brad Haddon as vice captain, David Warner, Ed Cowan, Phil Hughes, Shane Watson, who has not stood down from this squad, uh, Usman Khawaja, Chris Rogers, Matthew Wade, James Faulkner, Ryan Harris, Peter Stiddle, James Pattinson, Mitchell Stark, Nathan Lyon, Jackson Bird. Uh, and later I'll do the Tassotto numbers as well. Now, Popsy, when you hear that squad, what jumps out at you? I think it's the worst Australia squad since 1985. Now, when you say that, you've got to remember it's Australia, and there's never such a good thing as never such a thing as a bad Australia squad. Uh, it's a very sensible squad. John Inverarity is a, a very intelligent man. But, you know, it's not a squad that's going to set the uh, pulse race in, uh, among England cricket fans. Uh, Bretig, I mean, he's right, but, you know, not that we particularly care about English cricket fans, but he's right that it's not a pulse racing squad. Uh, but there's, I mean, from what I could tell, there's no one that they could have really picked other than Farwood Ahmed, who they've basically left the door open for anyway, uh, that would have actually got anyone to that. I don't think it would have been possible to... Uh pick a pulse racing squad in the uh, in the right sense. Maybe a pulse racing squad in terms of run for the ambulance, uh, but certainly not in terms of uh, pick an exciting team that's going to wipe the floor with England. That's just not possible. Australia, uh, Australia's wider cricketing system is is in a state at the moment where you know they, they don't have those resources, and so they're being forced to go back to the past to provide. Uh, to provide some solidity, some sturdiness, sturdy characters, sturdy cricketers uh, to go to England. Well, the most surprising one is Chris Rogers, and it's not really going back to the past. Cause, I mean, essentially, we've ignored him his whole career. Uh, maybe in an alternate reality, he scored quite a few runs, but uh, for, for Australia, he's done very little. Uh, I mean, is this? are they almost saying for the last two years that they should have picked him? And uh, it's not like he suddenly got better. And just suddenly go, well, we've got no leadership and experience left. We well, don't have to pick this guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, a couple, a couple of things there. I mean, uh, in those in those couple of years, Rogers has uh, has gone to uh, to Middlesex in England and uh, had some had some uh, decent success with a with a Division One side uh, in the UK and also playing at Lords can't uh, can't have hurt his uh, his cause uh, and and also. When I mentioned before about guys or got looking back to the past, they're looking back to guys who were forged at a time when the Australian cricket system was healthy, uh, at a time when Shield cricket was undoubtedly the best domestic competition, when there wasn't a huge big bash league hole in the middle of it, uh, and uh, and also at a at a time when you know you had to be averaging 50 to to be a chance, and and someone like Rogers could just be a fringe dweller despite scoring consistent runs. And I suppose the biggest uh, change in the thing is going to be Brad Haddon coming in. Uh, Brad Haddon, essentially, there's a, there's a leadership gap 
that ended up in homework gate, and uh, there's and a lot of people are going to be happy with that sentence. But uh, essentially, what we've got is uh, Australia, um, you know, with Husky and Ponting leaving, it, it, there's no doubt that they basically lost the guys who will come in and will say to a young player, "Mate, you've got to put in. You're not you're not trying hard enough." Haddon is definitely that guy. He's also the sort of guy that will help after hours with the players. He's the one who makes everyone feel right. And I always thought that he was a good match as a vice captain to Clark because Clark's not the most personable person. And uh, I always feel that Haddon is. Uh, but what do you think about Haddon coming in as keeper and as vice captain? Well, one of the things about Brad Haddon that's, uh, that's fascinating in his relationship with Clark is that, you know, he's Michael Clark's lieutenant now but he was Michael Clark's captaincy mentor in many ways as, the, as the, the captain of New South Wales at the time that Michael Clark was coming through. As a, he was an aggressive captain. He led by example. He, uh, of, of all statistics in Brad Haddon's career, one of the most significant ones I felt was that he had a terrific record playing for New South Wales in shield matches at the Gabba when Queensland were very strong and often playing as captain. So, you know, he, he had the ability to lead by example as a batsman. And as a gloveman... You know, Brad Haddon's probably not purely the best gloveman in the country. I'd say that that award would go to a Chris Hartley, but uh, he's certainly a more complete gloveman than than Matthew Wade, uh, and he's uh, he's also a gloveman who's who's kept wickets and kept kept wickets well in England in two thousand and nine. I think it's it a solid the uh, Wade is already uh, batted far better than um, Hatton. Um, Hopsy, you've seen a lot of Brad Hatton in a lot of test series that you've enjoyed. Uh, you, you're absolutely shaking your boots at his comeback, I would assume. I think he's a, he's a solid pick and uh, he's a good professional. But what's happening to Australia cricket where you, you have to pick a guy in his mid-30s and recall him to test cricket to make sure the team spirit in the dressing room is okay? Uh, I just find that absolutely astonishing. It's a huge indictment of uh, the collapse of the unity of the dressing room uh, in India under uh, Shane Watson as vice captain. And if you've got to bring back Brad Haddon as a vice captain in this sort of e emergency setting, then what does that say about what Watson's vice captaincy? His involvement in that dressing room in India, I, I think it's it's an embarrassment for Shane Watson. Yeah, well, it's an embarrassment for Australian cricket that they do have to go back to a 35-year-old, essentially uh, because they're worried that no no one is looking after the team at the moment. Uh, what about Ryan Harris, Brett? I mean, I'm a massive fan. He basically booked his spot uh, through that Shield final, although he did also beat Victoria in that other one-day final that we'll ignore. Um, I mean, he just looked like such a class above any other Australian bowler in, uh, at the end of that season, didn't he? Well, it's it's never a question of uh, what Ryan Harris can produce when he's on the park. Uh, the the standard of bowling that he delivers when he is fit is is world class. You know, it's uh, it's not it's not quite Dale Steyn, but it's uh, it's not it doesn't lose uh, an enormous amount by by comparison. He's he's quick enough. He bangs the ball hard into the pitch. He moves the ball both ways off the seam and through the air. He's consistent enough and experienced enough to know. To make the little adjustments in in different conditions, you know, he's bowled beautifully in Sri Lanka. He's also bowled beautifully at the Wacker in Perth. Uh, he's only bowled once or twice in England over the years, but I think when it when he has done, he's taken wickets. Um, it's just a matter of uh, making sure that that uh, this you know the sticking plaster that's holding his body together is um, is uh, is refreshed consistently enough to get him through. I mean, he he may only play two Test matches out of out of five, but if he can put solid yeah, out of ten. If he can put solid uh, performances uh, on the board in those in those two matches, it's it's probably going to have been worth it. And I suppose the last sort of a surprise, uh, although we all sort of thought he might get a game as well, is James Faulkner, who's been tearing up the IPL. He's been one of the best quick bowlers in the IPL this year. He was man of the match in the Shield final, uh, mostly for his batting. Uh, weirdly, I suppose as much as anything. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yet again, Australia just keeps tripping over these young, talented quick bowlers, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, James Faulkner. Uh, there's a couple of elements to him that uh, that the selectors find uh, find particularly attractive. One is that he's uh, he's got a lot of spirit in him. He's he's fiery. He's aggressive. Uh, some people might remember that during the uh, the summer he had the the temerity to sledge Chris Gale. He was uh, he was uh, pulled up by the ICC over that. But uh, you know, it's it's the sort of thing that uh, 
people look at someone who um, you who may be hated by opponents but loved by teammates. And James Faulkner seems to to fit that mould. The other thing is that as a as a as a bowler and as a batsman, he's just contributed at important times for for Tasmania. You know, he he's not um, he's not an out and out. Um, tear away fast bowler, and he's not a uh, he's not a batsman who's going to dominate in the way that a Shane Watson can, but he also has made runs at, at important times that someone like Shane Watson has occasionally gone missing. Yeah, I think um, I, I think the best thing for you, Hopsy, will be this summer if Australia are losing and you have Siddle, Faulkner, and Pattinson bowling because there will be some angry faces uh, for you to well, report on. I. I, I... Uh, it sounded uh, from listening to Dan like uh, they, they picked a specialist team spirit man and a specialist sledger. So I'm, sh I'm sure maybe it's going to be more fun than we thought. Um, personally, I'm I'm a bit upset Mitch isn't in. I, I love watching Mitchell Johnson for his great spells and his bad ones. And there's no sort of baby face Steve Smith uh, trying to make it in test cricket. So, so that'll be another disappointment for England fans. But, you know, before we get too cocky, this is a good pace uh, quintet, potentially, if it stays fit. And the first test's at Trent Bridge, and if the ball hoops around and Australia win a good toss, you know, by you could see a position by T on the first day where uh, we're not laughing as much as, as we think we might be. I think by the end of the series, England will come through strong, but um, you, know, you cannot dismiss an Australia side with, um, with this quality of pace attack. I think if you yeah, if you're might... a, a, a England opening batsman, whether you're Cook or Compton, you probably don't want to face Ryan Harris fired up on the first morning of any England test, really, if he's going to play. And obviously Pattinson's going to be well helped. I mean, we'll talk about Smith and, and Johnston a little bit as Hopsey brought them up. I mean, Mitchell Johnson probably has paid the price for just being, you know, rubbish in test matches. He's been quite well, uh, quite good in the IPL. But Steve Smith was... Unfortunate. I think basically his last summer where he struggled uh, in the one days against England probably is the reason he's not playing in the Ashes squad. Yeah, well, he's the uh, he's the he's the one unlucky he's the the one unlucky one out, out of the the group who missed out from uh, from India in uh, in going on the on the Ashes tour squad. He does stand out because he came into the Test team in the last two Tests in circumstances in which they had no other batsmen available to choose because they'd suspended Watson and Kawaja. Uh, but having said that, uh, when he did get a game, he put performances on the board. He he made a very very good ninety in the third test. He made a couple of handy scores in the in the fourth, and he fought his way through situations, which is something Australian batsmen lately have struggled to do. Uh, he has done all that, but I suppose they just couldn't look past the, the, the weaknesses around the off stump and the way he's played against England in the past. Um, Fawad Ahmed is the interesting one. Uh, John Inverarity's comments here, basically, I mean, he's essentially, John Inverarity has gone as close as he could to saying, Julia Gillard, if you give this kid a passport, or this man a passport, I will put him in the squad. But I can't put him in yet, so I'm just going to leave that open. Uh, I, come on, Hopsy. Who doesn't want to see a Pakistani Victorian? A leg spinner of who's of whatever age he claims to be playing in the ashes. I'd love him to come. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he was called up in emergency for the uh, final test with the ashes uh, still in the balance? These things have happened in history. Uh, Julia Gillard, sort yourself out. Get this man a passport as soon as possible. Well, not quite as soon as possible. Sort of early August. When the narrative needs it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Maybe give him two tests so we can build up the tension. I'd I'd love him to turn up. I don't think Nathan Lyon will um will have a great series. Um, yeah, seeing that seeing this kid turn up for a, a shock ashes test would would be wonderful stuff. And um, uh, Brady, we just talk about the Australia A squad a little bit, just very quickly. Um, it's basically it's got Jordan Silk in it, uh, who's probably booked his spot based on the the hundred in the Shield final. It's got Chad Sayers, who, from everything I've heard, bowls at about 12 miles an hour, but swings the ball both ways. Uh, and Nick Madison, I suppose, is the other interesting player in there. Everyone else is sort of fairly well known. Nick Madison burst onto the scene a couple of years ago, but he's been struggling of recent times. And he did, if I'm not mistaken, eat a sandwich on the field of play of recent times. Yes, he uh, he did he did that. It was a uh, the vi the video of uh, of him eating the sandwich was a. Uh, a point of some mirth at the Cricket New South Wales end of season awards, among other things. But uh, yes, he uh, Nick Madison's something of a of a of a poster child for the the current Australian young batting generation and some of the issues that they're that they're having with young batsmen. 
he came into the New South Wales team a couple of years ago as a 19-year-old kid with a lovely technique, uh, good composure, able to score hundreds, uh, but has since been um, has since been seduced a bit by 2020 cricket, and we've all of a sudden seen him hitting hitting sixes over cover in shield matches and beefing up in the um, in the in the gym to uh, to be able to hit the ball with with more power. And uh, yeah, his consistency as a first class batsman is um, is yet to uh, yet to eventuate, but he's extremely talented. Chad Sayers is a very consistent, uh, very consistent swing and seam bowler. Uh, he's um, he took a while to get into the South Australian squad because there was a perception he wasn't quick enough. But uh, yeah, his his ability to, to bowl wicket to wicket and uh, and move the ball a little bit either way is certainly something that uh, that could be useful uh, in England. Maybe not maybe not this Ashes series, obviously, but. Uh, 2015 uh, after the World Cup. That's uh, that's a possibility for him. Yeah, and Jordan Silk. I mean, we talk about Nick Maddinson, you know, taking, you know, uh, becoming a 2020 batsman. Jordan Silk made his hundred off 10,000 balls in the Shield final. So, uh, you know, he doesn't even need to be trained by Graham Hick. Hopsy, final word, because that's what they say at the end of these sorts of shows. Final word. What sort of Ashes squad is this? Uh, well, I was just listening to Dan then and. Uh... I, I think he's been listening to uh, John Inverarity too much. That was a marvellous phrase he came up with then. Uh, I think Inverarity will be saying our, our consistency has uh, taken too long to eventuate uh, about the end of the third test. Um, look, I think it's the worst Dashie squad on paper since 85. Then we had a lot of people to laugh at. We laughed at Murray Bennett bowling in his tinted glasses. Andrew Hilditch uh, hooking the ball all over the... Greg, Greg Ritchie, the uh, fat cat Ritchie. Uh, some fairly dodgy seamers uh, around, including Dave Gilbert, late in the series. Um, I don't think... Oh, and of course, Simon O'Donnell, who uh, was sort of Ian Botham's bunny. So it's not a squad uh, I think we'll be laughing at this time. I think it's a very solid squad. It's a very responsible squad, and it's an intelligent squad. And it's followed people like Brad Haddon, Chris Rogers, you don't laugh at people like that. They've had, they've had good careers, good workmanlike careers, and, and they deserve another opportunity. But it's not a great squad. I'd expect England to uh, to win the Ashes. Brezik, what do you think? What's your final say? I think it's just about the best squad that could be picked in the circumstances, and the circumstances are a wider issue that are going to take some time to... Uh, to be fixed up and sorted out and improved, but given the stock that they have available, I think they've uh, they've done a they've done themselves um, a favour by uh, by not uh, not damaging their chances at the selection table, and that's that's not something you could say for uh, too many Australian squads in the in the past few years. I think it's a stealer squad. I think it's a sort of squad that if England aren't watching themselves, they they can actually get done. It's I think there's a lot. Some quality cricketers in there, and there's some quality backups. The bat batting is always going to be the problem, but uh, I think it's a squad where Usman Kawaja and Phil Hughes probably don't have to play um, that much at all. And I think if that's the case, I can see Australia, you know, stealing a couple of tests. They may not win the whole series, but the way that England played against New Zealand, they're going to have to actually start playing good cricket again to to beat Australia. That is true, Jared. Uh, I've I've been laughing a little bit, but let's be honest. This England side are not quite at their peak. They're not quite as good as uh, maybe we think think they are. They've had a few shocks in the last year, um, and you feel like it's a side slightly beyond its peak. And if Graham Swan's not fit, if his comeback for Nottinghamshire uh, before the first test against New Zealand goes awry for any reason, then England will also uh, have things to worry about. Definitely. Anyway, we will end it there from myself, Dan Bredig, who's very disappointed he wasn't made vice-captain, and David Hobbs, who just wants to go to Durham. Thank you very much.